So it's underrated free agent point guards. I don't think Derrick Rose is underrated, so he's not going to be in this video. Uh, Ricky Rubio is in this video, and he's getting paid basically $15 million this year for Utah. The one criticism that you can throw at Ricky is his lack of a three-pointer, and maybe that non-jump shot is too fatal for him to play with Donovan Mitchell. And so is it possible that for all the good things that Rubio can do, he would be better for someone else rather than the Utah Jazz? Well, the thing with Ricky is he still makes plays for this team, and he is the best passer. I mean, I mentioned Donovan Mitchell a second ago, and his playmaking abilities are not to the level that Ricky's are, or at least his passing is. Mitchell, of course, uh, gets the defense swarming on him more often. And maybe it's going to take some time for Mitchell to be a leader on offense like that, even if he has been a bit better lately in this year. So perhaps they're still going to need Rubio for his passing chops. But at the same time, I could picture somebody else, uh, one team being the Phoenix Suns, who I think desperately need a guy who can get the ball to DeAndre Ayton. Um, that, you know, somebody might give Rubio some, uh, some money that Utah is not willing to match. So... There's that. Uh, we should also mention with Rubio, unless I'm just totally out of the loop, I think he's still a pretty decent defensive player as well. So he can do some things. The jump shot is what it is, of course. Next up is Malcolm Brogdon, who is having uh, his best season so far in the NBA. Granted, he hasn't been in the league very long, but he's been so efficient for Milwaukee whether it's outside jumpers or cutting to the rim, playing in the pick and roll, spacing the floor. He's fit in so well with Coach Bud's three-point slash Giannis being an alien happy system. And while I'm sure the Bucks would love to keep the dude, and I think they've acknowledged that by giving Bledsoe the contract they gave him, so that gives them one less thing to deal with in the offseason, I don't really know what he's going to be worth. I feel like some other team could talk themselves into the idea that Brogdon can do more for them because for all the stuff he can do, he is spending a lot of his time with this Bucks team, either playing second units as a primary ball handler or not having the ball much at all. So if you gave him the ball a little more often, asked him to create and play in the pick and roll, and you gave him perhaps a bit more money than the Bucks really want to pay him, then you might be able to get the guy. And you may get a dude who can be a real, uh, well, not just a piece of an offense, because he already is that, but perhaps a leader of an offense. So that's interesting stuff. Patrick Beverly is not a guy who anybody expects to lead an offense really in any way, but the defense is legit. And it's not just the defense, but it's also the energy that he brings to a team there are some guys who are good at defending their positions and there are other guys who just kind of wake the entire roster up when he's in the game and Beverly is one of those guys I would say he's kind of been a big reason why the Clippers have been as good as they are this year even if he's averaging like seven points a game or whatever it is and he's not going to cost that much money he's probably going to be the cheapest guy in this video so maybe seven to ten million dollars a year would be all it would take to get one of the better perimeter defenders in the league. Uh, a guy who, he's only like 6'1", but can defend a few different positions and get steals in the passing lanes and defend a lot of teams' best perimeter players and be pretty all right. And then offensively, the dude can make threes. He's not concerned with taking that many shots. He's not going to hijack the offense at any time. And I think... A guy who's a bit of a contrast to that, at least for this season, is Terry Rozier, who has uh, not adjusted well to the Celtics' influx of talent, a.k.a. Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving coming back, because he was taking so many shots in the playoffs, and he's wanted to do that this year, and it's resulted in his shot selection not being very good. Uh, but even with those things, I think Rozier still has talent, and while I can show him missing some threes that were perhaps questionable shots, he's still been a good outside shooter for pretty much his whole career. He, of course, made a lot of contested threes in the playoffs, so he's got some confidence in his game there. 
He's also really good at not turning the ball over. He's got one of the lowest turnover percentages in the league for point guards. And while I don't think he can be a big time playmaker, I think a solid five to maybe six assists a game is a, a fair prediction for him. And I also think Rozier as a starter is a lot better than him coming off the bench. So maybe some team could see him as a starting point guard. And the last one is uh, Jeremy Lin, who recently got picked up by the Raptors and his percentages for them have been pretty ugly, but he's been a solid fringe starter, sixth man guy. Uh, whenever he's been healthy for the last few seasons, I mean, the Hawks were winning games through parts of this year. I think he was a part of that. Whenever he was able to actually play for the Nets, he was a pretty serviceable guy who could just run pick and roll and make sure the offense is running well enough. I don't know if he's actually going to start for a team, whoever ends up signing him, but whenever he's in the game, you know that your team is not going to be stupid, and there's a lot to say for just putting NBA players on the floor who don't suck. So if Jeremy Lin ends up on some team that may or may not be a team that people care about at all, he's probably going to put up a solid, I don't know, 10 to 12 points a game, let's say, four to five assists, and it'll be kumbaya whenever he's in there. So yeah, underrated point guards.